Filipino Ser Forges Training. Um, I'm Lilian Silva. I'm the Clemson Forges Specialist at, uh, here in South Carolina. And I'll be moderating this training session along with Dr. Leanne Gillard, uh, who is the Forge Specialist at Auburn Inverse and the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. And uh, with Dr. Marcelo Valau, who is the Forge Special Extension Specialist at University of Florida. So before we get started, I'll just go through some housekeeping notes that I've been posting on the chat as well. So you probably noticed, but everyone uh, is muted uh, at entrance. It's just uh, a reminder that we will be presenting. So we would like you to keep um, muted throughout the presentation. And please, as you have questions, to chat them in the uh, chat box, because we would like to mm -hmm. uh, really be compiling those questions as you, uh, as you post them. Then we will address them later. Uh, we are recording this session, and uh, we will. Uh, I'll be sharing this link next week with everyone who registered for it. So, if you need to uh, to miss any a part of this um, this session, or you'd like to catch up later, you will be able to do that. And uh, last thing that I uh, have here is that we will have a second uh, training session this week. On Thursday, it's gonna be the same time. So two to 4 p.m. Eastern time. We will have uh, Dr. David Russell and Mr. Uh, Kent, Kent uh, Stanford uh, that day. And I'll talk a little more about that, but just as a reminder, as we go uh, through. So without any further ado, uh, let's get started. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Ball, and it's our pleasure to have him here today. So Dr. Ball received uh, his uh, master's uh, from Western Kentucky University and his PhD from Albert University. He was the extension for the crop agronomist in Albert University from uh, 1976 to uh, 2011. Dr. Ball received multiple honors and awards through his career and he's now a professor, professor emeritus at Albert University. So he, still, uh, he remains active in the forest world and he's really active uh, and engaged with industry academia uh, producers and extension until now, until uh, nowadays. Um, it's our pleasure to have you here, Dr. Ball, uh, and being able to hear from you and uh, hear you speak about the lessons that uh, you learn it and share your experiences with uh, the agricultural professionals that we, we have here today. So uh, with that, the floor is yours, Dr. Ball. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, well, hey, listen, thank you for inviting me. Uh, you and uh, Leanne Dillard and Marcelo Valaya and other people, uh, I appreciate having the opportunity to, uh, to make a presentation here today. Uh, I am currently Professor Emeritus at Auburn University. And by the way, I've been hanging out at Auburn University for a long time, in fact, as amazing as it may seem, I've had an office in that building, Extension Hall, for 47 years. I still have one as Professor Emeritus, uh, but 35 years working as Extension Forage Specialist. Now I work for the Oregon Forage Seed Commissions. There are four of those, clover, orchard grass, rye grass, tall fescue. I've worked for them for 12 years, basically doing uh, extension work uh, with them. So that makes 47 years total. So I should have learned something in that period of time. I don't know how much I did. But anyway, uh, by the way, I want to just say a word about the Oregon seed industry. Some people who are listening may not realize that um, about 90% of the cool season forage seed and turf seed produced in the United States is produced in the Willamette Valley. And in fact, there are a lot of people who are planting cool season species who probably don't even know that they've been planting Oregon produced seed, uh, but they the, the chances are overwhelming that they have been. And uh, the Oregon seed industry uh, provides a great service to us who are interested in forage livestock production. I'm a guy who uh, likes quotes a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm a big quotes guy, and I'm gonna use a number of quotes in this presentation. Here's one that I've taken a certain amount of comfort from in recent years. 
with age comes wisdom. You've all heard that, I know. But I saw a slightly different version of that just recently. And it went like this. Wisdom doesn't necessarily come with age. Sometimes age just shows up all by itself. And, and I think that is actually more true than, than the first version. Well, I was invited to just talk about some things that I've experienced during my career that hopefully will be of interest to a lot of you. And I, and I know that there are quite a few of you who have five years or less of experience. Perhaps the comments I make will be of particular value to you. But I'm gonna talk, I'm, really this is gonna be a three-stage presentation. Major truths about forage production, lessons of experience, and get this, getting things done. Now, I, you know, I can't see the audience. Usually when I give a talk, I can see the audience. So I just have to visualize the audience today, but I do have a, a pretty uh, vivid imagination. So here's, here's what I'm visualizing. I'm visualizing that this is a very uh, photogenic, attractive group, really smart looking people, and that you're all really attentive. You've got pens and pads of paper or maybe a laptop on, on the edge of your seat, wanting to take notes and gonna listen attentively to everything I say. That's, that's, that's my visualization. We'll see how it goes. Oh, wait a minute. What is, what is that? But that looks like, that looks like mistletoe on a hip pocket. How did that get in my presentation? I have no idea how that, how that got there or what it means, but uh, I don't know. It does remind me to say that, uh, you know, I don't have to sugarcoat things. I don't have to be politically correct. I don't have to worry about what administrators say or think or do. I have no reason to lie to you. I, I may be wrong about some things, probably, probably am, but I can promise you that everything I say today, I believe in my heart is the truth. And I hope some of it will be of interest and value. But I'm gonna start with some major truths about forage livestock production. Before I really get into that, I want to say something else. You know, we, we all are blessed in so many ways. And one of the things that I think we are, one of the ways I think we are blessed is getting to do what we do. In my opinion, um, farm people are simply salt of the earth people. They are hardworking or by and large, they're hardworking, conscientious, kind, good people. Uh, as our extension people and other uh, other agricultural workers, but I, you know, I'm thankful that I've had the chance to to work with and help people like that. And then the other thing I think that we all need to be thankful for is we're all interested in forage livestock production, and it's such an interesting area. I mean, after all, in the southeast we've got over 60 forage species that are regularly planted. Uh, they all have their own uh, characteristics. You know, they have different yields, forage quality, distribution of growth, uh, you know, stand uh, persistence and so forth. And they can't all be grown together. And then you add in the fact that the, the forage crops interact with the soil and you bring in the animals. It's so interesting. I mean, you know, if you, if you took some other area like, I don't know, pineapple production or something, we don't grow pineapples, but you know, if you were focused on pineapples, you could learn everything about pineapples in about three weeks, I think. And then it would be boring after that. The forage livestock area is never boring. So that's a couple of things I think we can really be thankful for as forage livestock enthusiasts. All right, here's one major truth that I've discovered in, in my career. And that is that if you wanna have a good forage livestock program, there are some things you just need to learn. There's some basic knowledge that's required. One of these is you need to know what your forage crop options are. In my opinion, every forage livestock producer ought to know every forage crop that is adapted to be grown on his or her farm in every field. Uh, you know, and know something about them like uh, distribution of growth, yield, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, and it did, I mean, how can you pick the best things to grow if you don't know what your options are? And the other thing is, 
you have to have a good understanding of animal nutritional needs in order to meet the nutritional requirements of those animals. So those are just two basic things that uh, you have to know up front. Producer has to do a little work to learn that, but that's very important in developing an efficient and effective forage program. Alexander Graham Bell made a statement that applies to that sort of thing. Before anything else, preparation is the key to success. Here's another major truth. Forage stand establishment is absolutely critical. After all, if you don't have a good forage stand, you're not going to get good forage production. And uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but a, lo a lot of the things that uh, are important for producers to do are things like what you see here. And a lot of us distribute information about that, as do commercial companies and, and other organizations. Um, I think a, a key point is that a big part of doing a good job of establishing plants is, is taking care uh, to, to pay attention to detail. And, uh, and that stuff, it can be done. And by the way, establishment is a time when we really need to pay attention to detail because forage plants are most vulnerable when they're small seedlings and, uh, and, and, and we need to really be sure that nothing goes wrong in that process. And I want to also focus a little bit on one other thing, and that is seed. Seed is critically important. And I'm talking about getting seed, uh, first of all, a species that's well adapted in the spot where it's going to be planted. It needs to be good quality seed. Um, and, uh, and it needs to be of a good variety that can get the job done that a producer wants and needs to get done. Um, I think that business of variety a lot of times is not taken as seriously as it should be. And here's another quote, good variety of decisions don't guarantee success, but bad ones can guarantee failure. And that is the absolute truth. And I wanna, I wanna just go through a little hypothetical situation real quickly here. Let's say that a producer wants to plant a forage crop that requires 20 pounds of seed per acre. And he goes down to the local co-op or seed store and he sees two different seeds there. I'm gonna say option A, I could say variety A. Some people don't even think about varieties if they plant common seed, which is ridiculous, should never do that. But option A, let's say it's a dollar a pound, 20 pounds per acre would be $20 per acre investment in that seed. Option B, a dollar 50 a pound, $30 an acre. Well, if the producer doesn't know much about option A and option B, he or she might be inclined to go with that option A because it's half as expensive uh, or half again, uh, less expensive than, than option B. But when you're buying seed is not the time to cut corners as far as price is concerned, because here's, here's a critical question. That's $20, I mean, $10 difference per acre in option A and option B. So a, a critical question would be, how much additional yield or better quality or better distribution of growth or likely stand persistence would it take to amount to $10 per acre? And the answer to that is not much. And I, unfortunately, I, I see a lot of people who do try to cut corners on seed. To tell you the truth, in my opinion, I mean, people, people need to learn what their variety options are and not, not try to save money on seed. In fact, you'd actually be better off to buy the most expensive seed all the time than to buy the least expensive seed, which leads to this statement, cheap seed is rarely a bargain. I think the, the, the main reason that a lot of people sell their seed cheap is because they know it's not worth much for Pete's sake. And here's another thing, all of you know this, but soil fertility and nutritional uh, nutrient considerations are critically important. For one thing, that affects forage yield, it affects, it, it affects the ability of forage crops to compete. Broom sage, which you see there, is really a not highly aggressive crop. It's able to come in when forage crops are not highly competitive, and there's another factor or two that affects them coming in too. But bottom line is, uh, you know, fertility, 
and pH are something we can do something about. I mean, we can we can put the material out and provide good uh, growing situations nutrient wise for plants. But there is one little problem with that, and that is that fertilizer and lime are expensive. In fact, they're usually at least 40 to 60 percent of the cost of pasture grass production. I haven't been looking at uh, forage crop budgets lately, maybe even more than that now because, because things are expensive. So that being the case, of course, it's important to take soil tests. I don't even like to, I don't, I don't like to talk about soil tests because it's boring and mundane, but it's just a, it's a necessary evil. Uh, if, if a person does not test the soil, obviously uh, he's going to have to guess at what he puts out and, uh, and gonna probably get it wrong. I did a little exercise in my office uh, three or four years ago, which I, I made some uh, assumptions about what over fertilizing or under fertilizing might result in as far as the economics of an operation. And it didn't take me long to figure out that soil testing can actually be worth several hundred dollars per hour. That is a fact. It's, and, and the higher the fertilizer prices go, the truer that is. And here's uh, another statement from, uh, I guess, uh, Forges 101. I, I assume you all know this, but for the record, I'm going to mention it. You got two different situations there. On the left, somebody's making hay, and that's a situation in which there's high nutrient removal. The nutrients are taken away from that field. On the other hand, on the right, you see some cows, and there's nutrient recycling that comes into play there. And I've come to appreciate this business of nu nutrient recycling more uh, toward the end of my career than I did at the beginning of my career. Livestock consume a lot of forage and therefore they consume a lot of nutrients, but it's literally in one end and out the other because most of those nutrients, about 80% of them, are excreted in the form of urine or, or dung. And that's a really important consideration. Here's a true statement, absolutely. Where animals go, nutrients flow, that's a fact. But it isn't just the animals that are moving nutrients around. If you sell hay off the farm, for example, that's a nutrient flow off of the farm. Or if you buy hay or other uh, feed for animals, that's a nutrient flow onto the farm. If you produce hay in one field and feed it in another, that's a nutrient flow from one field to the other. And then you have situations within fields that affect nutrient flows. For example, if there's a big tree in the middle of a pasture, there's gonna be a nutrient flow to the spot under that tree. And I can assure you that the uh, fertility situation under that tree is gonna be a lot different than it would be out in the pasture. That's not to say that you shouldn't ever have a tree in your pasture. I'm just saying that there are a number of things that affect nutrient flows. And it, it seems to me that a producer would do well to periodically think about where nutrient flows are on his or her farm. There are nutrient flows on every farm. Try to figure out where they are and what can be done to make them more favorable so the nutrients are spread out more evenly and affect uh, nutrition, you know, the nutrient levels in different areas of the farm more e equally, because that will affect uh, ultimately the economics of the operation. Oh, here's another great truth. Forage legumes should be used whenever feasible. We could talk about for a week about forage legumes. There's tons of data that show uh, information that reflect on legumes in a favorable light. But I want to tell you about one situation that we did at Auburn University that I think really tells the story pretty, pretty well. Through the years, there have been a lot of stocker cattle uh, research projects done in Alabama on a lot of different forage species. And uh, we got the idea, wouldn't it be interesting to look at these stocker cattle grazing projects and typically animals would go on pasture about 400 pounds and be taken up to maybe seven or 800 pounds, something like that. So we looked for studies that were at least three years in length on different forage species 
to uh, just to, to, to sort of compare them a little bit. We found 37 different pasture systems, and we took the key uh, the key points from those like you know, gain per acre, gain per animal, uh, stocking rate, you know, days of grazing, things like that, and put them all in one table. And by the way, of those 37 pasture systems, 15 involved legumes, about 40% involved legumes. And then when we got that put together, and that was really interesting stuff. And by the way, I could provide a copy of that to somebody if you don't like to see it. But anyway, one of our economists helped us they do budgets for growing forage crops. So he took the data from animal performance uh, on pasture and married that up with the cost from our budgets and calculated pasture cost per pound of gain. And here's what came out of that. The seven lowest pasture cost per pound of gain and eight of the 10 lowest involved legumes, legumes and pastures. And here's another major truth, pest damage and animal disorders need to be prevented or minimized. There are a lot of things that you could talk about, or we could talk about. I wanna talk about year after year as well. Here's another major truth, grazing management is of immense value. There are, there are a lot of benefits of good grazing management. I can't even talk about all of them, there are so many. But one, one is that you get better utilization of the forage. If you drive around in the South, in most of the pastures, less than half of the forage is getting inside of the animals, less, less than half of the pasture forage. Well, data from around the world shows that better utilization of forage can result in 20 to 30% better utilization of pasture forage. That's like adding 20 to 30% more pasture to, to a particular uh, area. You get more even nutrient recycling. I mentioned that earlier. If you're moving animals around, that's going to spread around those recycled nutrients. And you can get more forage produced. Now, how could that be? Well, that's because pastures are like solar collectors. Those leaves are collecting sunlight. That's where the energy for food production comes from. If you have a solar collector and you cover part of it up or eliminate part of it, you're not going to get as much uh, interception of sunlight and, and uh, interception of, uh, of uh, energy. So if pastures are overgrazed, for example, um, you've reduced the size of the solar collector. Also, if leaves get really old before they're utilized, they're not as effective, and that hurts the uh, solar collector process as well. When you have good grazing management, you tend to have fewer weeds because you can make the animals eat some of the of the weeds, which uh, some weeds are not very good at tolerating that. Dr. David Russell is going to talk more about weed control on Thursday. And you have less overgrazing if you have good grazing management. Now, I think most of us, when we think about overgrazing, we think about a situation like this where areas way overstocked and uh, you know everything's grazed down to a nub and of course that is overgrazing but I want to point out that overgrazing can occur and it may not be apparent and that's because animals selectively graze they tend to graze if they have the opportunity they tend to graze the species that they like best which are almost always the best plants in the pasture and if they do that and pretty much ignore a lot of other plants, you know, that that hurts, that that weakens the really good plants and may even take them out of the pasture. So, you know, uh, grazing management can stop both kinds of overgrazing. And by the way, grazing management can reduce the impacts of weather as well, because here's a fact that if you don't know, you need to know. That is that when when pastures are overgrazed, uh, any kind of grass in particular, the root growth stops just right away. And uh, in fact, in, in our grazing schools that I used to help with, you, you can take plugs of any kind of grass, three plugs of equal size, clip one of them simulating overgrazing, clip one at about a four inch height, which is about right for a lot of our pastures, and unclip one, not clip one at all, 
do that for a week, once a week for a month. And the difference in root growth will be shocking, absolutely shocking. That's just a fact. Oh, here's another good one. Major truth. Minimizing stored feed requirements should be a prime objective in just about any livestock operation. There are a lot of things we could talk about. Some, some big items would be in, some, in many areas, not, not all, but in many areas, it's possible to grow warm season and cool season perennial forages. Having some of both is a good thing because you keep the animals grazing longer. Growing legumes with grasses, at least in some situations, can help extend the grazing season. Complementing perennials with annuals is a great strategy. And we do that particularly well in the uh, Gulf Coast states where we oversee uh, uh, Bahia grass and Bermuda grass with winter annuals. Stockpiling forage is a great technique, especially with tall fescue. And some people have the opportunity to graze crop residues. Now, not everybody can do all of those things, but the point I wanna make is that producers who are interested in, in profitability need to do as much as they can to extend the grazing season and, uh, and uh, minimize the amount of stored feed they need. Oh, here's a, here's a great quote. In fact, feel free to quote me personally on this if you want. It costs less when livestock harvest the forage. Don Ball, February 7th, 2023. It costs less when livestock harvest the forage. Oh, and here's, a, here's another one. This is a place where we can, we can make a lot of progress. Hay storage and feeding losses are profit destroyers. You know, we make a lot of good hay in Alabama and elsewhere in the Southeast. Unfortunately, it doesn't get inside the animal at a time when it can do them much good. And uh, of course, uh, you don't have to have a, a cover over hay to do a pretty good job of uh, minimizing uh, hay storage losses, but having a cover is a pretty great thing to do. And here's another wonderful quote, in my opinion. Some folks pay for a hay barn they never build because in essence, they're paying for that hay barn every year in the losses they're incurring as a result of not doing a very good job of storing their hay. And also, we need to keep in mind that uh, feeding losses can actually exceed 50%. So, I mean, the, the opportunity for doing a better job of uh, storing and feeding hay exists on a lot of farms. And I wanna point out, uh, this is a profound thought. Hay losses are actual losses. I talked earlier about opportunity costs with the tall fescue thing. This is the opposite of that. If a producer makes hay, they have already put all of the thought, time, effort, sweat, money into it, and then it's lost. It's a real loss. We need to help producers minimize those kinds of losses. And I wanna say also that uh, this is a major truth and this applies not only to forage livestock producers, but to extension and other agency workers as well. Results require investments. And here, here's a good, a good quote that's worth, to rem worth remembering right here. And that is, there ain't no free lunch. Uh, you know, in this world, we usually don't get something for nothing, and you're not going to have a good forage livestock program without putting something into that forage livestock program. And I mentioned earlier that I, I feel very strongly about how great farm people are, and I'm especially oriented toward forage livestock producers. And if if you want to help them out, as I do, uh, you know, there are some things that we really need to focus on, I think. Now, there's, there are some things that producers can't do anything about. They can't do anything about the weather. They can't affect livestock prices. They can't affect input costs. But here's some things that they can do. Waste and inaction severely hurts profit on many farms. I think hay, I would put hay kind of at the top of the list. There is so much wasted 
uh, hay or, you know, just storage and feeding could be so much better. I think a lot of my livestock producer friends know they're not doing as good a job as they could, but they don't realize how much it's costing them. Hay is a, is a thing that's, that's hurting us a lot. Same thing applies to pasture forage. If you don't have pretty good grazing management, a lot of that pasture forage is going to be wasted. And then the whole thing about plant nutrients, if people don't soil test, a lot of times they'll put out more fertilizer than they need, or, or on the other hand, not enough. And also this thing of the, you know, recycling nutrients is an important thing. That's something that can be uh, corrected, but it, it requires some, some attention. And then there are, there's just the thing of inaction about opportunities that exist a particularly good example being the the tall fescue toxic tall fescue thing so we can help producers with those things and i think we need to focus on doing that all right now <laughs> oh me sorry about that all right i want to talk about some lessons of experience now I, you know i had a chance to just reflect on some things these things just came to my mind that uh you know I don't know. Some of these are just kind of silly, maybe, but they came to my mind. So I thought I would mention them in this presentation today. One is if you make a farm visit and you're offered snake guards, my advice is wear them. <laughs> I was on a farm one time where a guy did that and I thought it was kind of silly. And about three hours later, I almost stepped on a big timber rattler. So that's just maybe it's common sense, but uh, throw that out for what it's worth. Here's another thing. Um, Producers love their livestock breeds. So my advice is never criticize a livestock breed. One of my uh, animal science counterparts wrote something in an article one time criticizing a livestock breed. And uh, he got in a heap of trouble over that. In fact, he ended up in the dean's office with a group of seed stock producers explaining why he shouldn't have done that and would never do it again. Similar kind of thing. Never criticize a commercial product without having backup data. Another colleague of mine uh, did that. And uh, it got back to a guy who was producing that product who happened to be politically influential. And this guy had to end up making a, a trip with one of our administrators to this guy's uh, business. And uh, I'm sure the administrator chewed on him all the way over and all the way back. And uh, he kind of had a bad attitude thereafter as a result of that particular incident. Oh, and here's one I have some personal experience with. If a bull doesn't seem to like you, stay away from him. <laughs> uh, I had a, I was with a county agent visiting a farm. We got out of the truck and uh, I was taking some pictures, wasn't, paying any attention to the bull. I've been around cattle all my life. This bull decided he didn't like me. And thereafter, he proceeded to act like at least he wanted to kill me. And interestingly, he wasn't after the county. He just didn't like me for some reason. So anyway, I learned something that day. It wasn't that particular bull, but but it was a bull that looked a lot like that. It had long floppy ears, just like that. Oh, and here's something that, uh, now this is the kind of stuff you don't get from textbooks right here. You know, I want to say a little word about submission of reports. We all have to do some reports and uh, administrators hate it when you don't get your reports in on time. It's like a, it's like a pet peeve of a lot of administrators. And, but on the other hand, um, if you get your report in too early before everybody else turns their report in, they may have a lot of time to look at it and find some things wrong with it. So here's my advice about reports. Don't submit reports late, but you definitely don't want to submit them early, okay? <laughs> anyway, all right, here's another thing. I have personal experience with this one too. Don't make the following statement. That could never work, especially don't make that statement in front of a group because as sure as you do that, somebody's going to hold up their hand and say, well, I did that. It worked just fine for me. Producers are ingenious, they're inventive, and sometimes they can make anything work. That's my experience. Oh, and now this, this picture tells a story. There's a guy talking to a farmer 
And uh, you might think, well, uh, that does that does that say something about the business he's in? Is he is he in the forage? I'm talking about the person talking to the farmer. Is he in the forage livestock business? Is he uh, is he in the education business? Is he in the consulting business? Well, uh, I think all of those could be argued. However, I want to make another point, a broader point, and that is that in reality, I think we are in the people business. Just think about it. If we can't interact well and appropriately with people, we're not going to be able to get the job done that we want to do. So I want to say a few things about this business of interacting with people. Now, we deal with some pretty crusty characters sometimes. They ask a lot of questions. And by the way, sometimes they'll ask questions that they know the answer to just to see if you know the answer. And if somebody asks you a question and you don't know the answer, the appropriate response is, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll check on that and I'll get back with you and then do it. That is the, the appropriate response. Here's a... Uh, Here's a, a great quote by Teddy Roosevelt, one of the former presidents of the United States. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And by the way, when I first got into extension, I heard that. I thought that was just an extension quote. I just only learned recently Teddy Roosevelt said that. But that's true. If, if, if people don't sense that you really want to help them, they're not going to listen to what you have to say. That's just the way it is. And by the way, I recently read a book by Teddy Roosevelt. Some of you might be interested in reading. The name of it is River of Doubt, D-O-U-B-T, River of Doubt. It's not a political book, just a really good, interesting book that you might enjoy. And here's something that I guess is just common sense. Maybe you all know this already, but again, for the record, you tend to get back what you give out. If you are positive and happy and have a positive message, you're going to get that back. If you have a negative message, you're going to get that back. It makes life so much more fun if you if you are pleasant with people and uh, strive to get along with them. Here's another thing that I think is important. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that help us do our jobs. I'm talking about support staff of various types, secretaries and, you know, technicians and, you know, maintenance people. They all are doing things that help us do our job. It just makes sense to be considered to them. And by the way, another thing I've noticed is that when you're working on things, you, you accomplish something, credit can be divided an infinite number of ways. Now, blame tends to stand alone, but credit, you can divide it an infinite number of ways. And when somebody helps you do something, my goodness, you need to give them credit for it. They just, you know, even if it's only marginal, it makes sense to do that. Uh, it makes people feel good. And by the way, it's human nature to try to repay things if you're if you're nice to somebody they'll probably be nice to you as well here's here's one that's absolutely true you get more done when you work with others if there's any key to success for anything i've done in my career it would be that i have always been able to work with good people that's things work a lot better when i work with good people than i try to do things by myself now there are some people out there who who are grumpy and they will be critical and, you know, when somebody provides criticism, it, I think it makes sense to, to think about it, consider it, because, you know, you might think of some things, some ways that you can actually improve your operation. But my advice is don't only consider that criticism briefly. Uh, some people like to criticize and they like to make people feel bad. You just got to realize that's the case. And one last thing. That in my experience, really differentiates uh, top extension workers from those who are less than top, and that would be attitude. There, I've heard some referred to as extension attitude, although it could be applied to a lot of other things besides extension. And I found a quote that I think expresses this pretty well. Quote worth remembering, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, for all the people you can. That a guy named John Wesley wrote that, and that's pretty much the uh, the attitude that I've seen in a lot of really top extension workers. All right, one more thing I want to talk about. I want to talk a little bit about getting things done, and what I really want to talk about here is time management. And this may seem like a strange 
thing for somebody like me to talk about, but I think it's important. So therefore I'm going to talk about it. I think time is actually our most valuable resource. And we, most of us probably don't spend enough time thinking about that. Heaven knows we have plenty of things to do. And I'm not going to read all those things to you, but all those things are things that we do in extension and that other people do that are not an extension. Just pick out two or three of those. I mean, for example, meetings, uh, demos or applied research, uh, publications. You can spend all your time on just those things. So in other words, the bottom line is, I found out early in my career that I could not possibly do all the things that really need to be done. And by the way, that's a picture of me early in my career. And you notice that I, I don't have any gray hair. I'm not wearing glasses and, and you don't see a computer. That's because I didn't have a computer. And frankly, I didn't see why I needed one at that point. Now, now I've got gray hair. I wear glasses all the time. I've got two computers and a smartphone. I couldn't get by without any of them. But anyway, that, that whole thing, I, I realized that really time is the limiting factor, I think, in extension. So it makes sense to try to use your time as well as you can. And here's a big irony. This is absolutely true. The better you do your job, the more difficult it becomes to do it because the more your reputation goes, uh, grows, the more people you help, you know, the word gets around, you get more people wanting to contact you and want, want you to help them. It makes it even more difficult to do what you need to do. I have developed the attitude that there are some similarities between time management and the game of golf. That may sound a little strange, but that's my, that's my opinion. Because some people have more natural ability than other people. Heaven knows I don't have much natural ability when it comes to golf and not very much when it comes to time management either. Uh, practice helps no matter where you are and skills will decline without continual effort. If you look at some of the greatest golfers of all time, like Tiger Woods and Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicklaus, once they got to be good golfers, did they stop practicing? No, they kept working at it. And that's what you have to do with time management as well, in my opinion. And here is a misconception, I think, about time management. And that is that time management is for overachievers. Well, the fact of the matter, that's correct. It is for overachievers, but I would make the point it's also for underachievers as well, because you think about it, we all are going to have to do some work. And if you exercise a few time management skills, let's say you're somebody that is an underachiever and doesn't want to do any more than you have to. If you have some time management skills, at least you can get the work you have to do done more quickly so you can goof off. And I want to mention, make another just passing mention of something. This is a quote from uh, Alice in Wonderland. If you don't know where you want to go, any road will get you there. And what I'm referring to here is that I think it helps to have some goals. It helps me, at least. In fact, I find goals to be magic. And the reason I think they're magic is that if you have a big goal that you're serious about, you're going to encounter dozens and maybe hundreds of issues and situations where, you know, you could inch just a little bit closer to that goal. And the cumulative effect of those decisions and actions is where the magic comes in. I wanna mention a few time management techniques real quickly. Planning is important. In fact, the time management books say that for every minute you spend planning, you'll save five minutes in performing a task. And I want to introduce you to something called the Pareto Principle. This is also sometimes referred to as the 80-20 rule. And what this is, it's the idea that about 80% of the effects are associated with about 20% of the items. For example, 80% of the dirt is on 20% of the floor. 80% of the health problems in a beef herd, probably on about 20% of the animals. 80% of what you get from reading a book or, or a, going to a conference would be from probably 20% of the items that you're exposed to. So the point is that with, with regard to time management, most people are getting, uh, they're not doing a very good job 
of, of the 20% of items that are going to really help them. In fact, if you can increase that 20% to more than 20%, that's where you're really going to help yourself. Uh, so that being said, here are the three best things to do on a daily basis. Number one, prioritize. Number two, prioritize. And number three, prioritize. In other words, you need to do the most important things first. And that's a lot easier to say than it is to do. But that's what really uh, gets the job done. And when I look back over my career, the things that I think I, where I made the, the best contributions were things that weren't urgent. They were really important, but they weren't urgent. I think it's worthwhile to make a daily or weekly plan or both. Now, maybe some people don't need to do that. I do. Oh, and here's a good one. Remember this, write this down, eat the frog first. What I'm talking about here, do the most unpleasant task first. If there's several things you want to do and one of them is eat a frog, you might as well do that first because it's all going to be easier. It's going to be downhill after that. There's a thing called contrarian timing, doing things when other people aren't doing them. Most of us do that to some extent, like most of us wouldn't plan to drive through Atlanta during rush hour if, unless we had to. But there are a lot of other things that can be done. I worked with a guy for a while. He was in my department. But uh, he didn't come to work eight and go home about five like most of us. He came into work at seven. He could always find a parking place next to the building. Uh, he had uh, seven to eight to work on things, very quiet. Go to lunch at 11. Uh, he, if he went to a restaurant, it was never crowded. When he came back, he could always find a parking place by the building. Go in and work from 12 to 1, uh, you know, uninterrupted. Then we'd go home at 4 and meet his kids and, and play when they got home from school. Now, most of us can't do that, but there are a lot of things that we can do when other people are not doing them and save a lot of time in that manner. Setting deadlines for yourself and others is psychologically important. Try to know that some of you may find this one to be uh, strange or wrong. Try to minimize wasting time in committees. Committee meetings can be boring. In fact, I've been in some committee meetings that are just about like that. Um, in fact, one of the things that I, I like about retirement is I don't have to attend any more boring committee meetings. Don't get me wrong. We have to have committee meetings. It's just that a lot of committee meetings are not, not very good. If you volunteer to be on a committee that you know is not going to be worth much, it's like saying, sure, I'd love to waste my time. When can we start? So what, what, what about committees? Some of these things can only be done by the chairman, but if you can avoid involvement in a committee that you don't really need to be involved in, do it. That's my advice. If you can meet only when necessary, maybe as the committee as a whole or for you attending the committee, minimize the committee size is helpful because some people like to hear themselves talk and make them go a lot longer than they should. It's always helpful to distribute an agenda so people know what's going to be discussed so they have time to think about it before they get there. And then somebody should be assigned the task of taking notes and then distribute them as appropriate, uh, particularly putting down what was decided and who decided, who said they would do what and when they would do it. Here's a great time management tool, waste basket. If you handle things more than once, you know, you're, you're, you're duplicating the time you're, you're involved in that. The uh, delete button on uh, emails works the same way. And there is not a perfect correlation between neatness and uh, productivity, but I think it helps to maintain neatness in work areas because you can find things easier and it helps your image. Making notes is a good thing. These days we can do that on the telephone, which is, is a helpful thing. And I want to tell you one last thing. This is actually, uh, maybe it's in some respects, it's a time management te technique. But it's, it's really a, a memory technique that I want to explain to you very quickly. It's called the journey method. What the journey method is, is it's, it's a way of tying some things you want to remember to uh, 
something you already know. Let me give you a quick example. Let's say you wanted to make a list of five grocery items. And of course, you could write this down on a piece of paper or something if you wanted to, but let's say you want to remember five grocery items. Let's say they were potato chips, oranges, popcorn, milk, and uh, tomatoes. If you can visualize something you already are familiar with that associates those items with that, then you can remember them. For example, let's say you're in bed and you visualize yourself kicking a potato chip bag up in the air. Kick it, kick it, kick it. Bed, potato chips. And let's say you've got a table by the bed and it's got it's stocked up with oranges. Table, oranges. And then you go in your bathroom and instead of seeing reflection in the mirror, you can see right through it and there's bunches of popcorn back there. Then you turn the shower on. And instead of water coming out, milk comes out. Then you look up at the ceiling of the bathroom, and there are tomatoes all over the ceiling. You know, you can remember those five things by visualizing those spots. Now, I'm talking here about five things. You can make it 10 things. You can make it 50. You can make it 100. As long as you can visualize something you're already familiar with, with the items you want to remember. And it doesn't have to be items. It could be people, it could be topics. In fact, I have on numerous occasions given a talk of an hour's length or more with no notes and no PowerPoint using that technique to remember topics I wanted to discuss. That technique has served me well in my career. And I realize that 80% of you probably won't be interested in that, but maybe 20% will. And by the way, on this time management thing, I have a paper that I wrote on time management. The reason I wrote it was because I gave a, I was asked to give a talk on that topic and writing a paper was part of it. I didn't come up with the ideas, but I did write the paper. If you would like that paper, send me a message and I'll be happy to send it to you. Thank you. I, I, hope, uh, I hope something I said will be of interest and value. Thank you so much, Dr. Bob. Really appreciate uh, your talk and was really informative. So right now we would like to welcome a couple of questions from the audience. You can unmute yourself if you'd like to, uh, to just ask the question yourself. Does anyone have, has a question? Seems like uh, our audience is quite, it's a little quiet today. And if I can, I will probably start with the question for Dr. Ball. I have many questions here, but I, I did read the Teddy Roosevelt book or Candice Miller's book on Teddy Roosevelt, which is fantastic. Think about tough people. Whenever we think we're tough, I just think about those old folks uh, pioneering in, in, in any country. In that case, it was in, in the western side of Brazil in the Amazonia. It was fantastic. But Dr. Ball, we, you mentioned that um we need to we need to do our best to serve and serve all and i, I forgot the all the all the quotes there in terms of uh do it all and uh serve all and and everywhere um but i think a lot of us new faculty really struggle with the balance of we're wanting to to serve everybody and then soon we get overwhelmed and i remember something that he said that i identified myself with in an interview to dennis hancock that you thought that you were going to, you were very frustrated in the beginning of the career because you thought you're going to solve every problem in extension within that year and you couldn't. So can you, can you enlighten us, enlighten us a bit with that, uh, 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 from that perspective? Well, you know, as I said, you know, they, uh, there is more to get done than we can ever get done. So I think we, we need to keep in mind, uh, try to keep in mind at all times, uh, that there are, you know, try try to prioritize and and work with the people. You know, it's, it's particularly helpful to work with people who uh, are really respected by their peers because if you can make progress with them, then there's going to be a trickle down effect from that. Uh, and and the you know this business of urgency versus importance. It's, it's a never ending struggle. You know, it's, it's easy to say, I need to work on the most important things first. Uh, but then you have these urgent things that are screaming for attention. And, uh, and you have to do some of those, you know, to, get, to keep your job. But it's not easy, Marcelo. And, um, 
Um, you know, I, my my feeling is though that if somebody comes to me with a question, it's important to them, and whether they've got uh, you know a thousand head of cattle or one head of cattle, that's important to them. My my uh, challenge is to try to reach as many of those people as possible without uh, taking away from you know uh, working with somebody else. And uh, fortunately, you know, with uh, internet and you know newsletters and radio and television, we we can reach a lot of people uh, simultaneously, and we need to try to do as much of that as we possibly can. And by the way, another thing I didn't mention, but you know, this this thing of work life balance is, uh, I think, everybody in extension or in any job who is conscientious and has a lot of work to do has to struggle with that. I mean, you don't, you know, the last thing in the world you need to do is neglect your family uh, or your friends, you know, but on the other hand, you know, it, in just about any job to, to be successful requires a lot of work. That's, that's the way it is. And that's always a struggle too. You never get over that. I mean, you, you, you always have to think about whether you're spending too much time at work or not. And it, that's, Everybody has to make up their own mind about that. Dr. Ball, I wanted to uh, ask you one question because, um, and we we talked about kind of like the breakdown about the agents uh, and other pers agricultural personnel that are currently here at this uh, training and will be uh, checking out later as well. So yeah. a little more than 3%, a little more than one third of the total here uh, are early uh, career uh, agents and ag professionals. So I'm just questioning more thinking of uh, some things that uh, they might be wondering. And uh, I would like to ask you, what would be your uh, advice on the best strategy for them to use when they're communicating with their clientele? They might not be necessarily, um, they might not have a lot of experience. So like what was one strategy that you, uh, you find it really worked for you and you think that's worth for them to try? You're talking about a subject, a, a particular uh, management technique or something like that? Is that what you're talking when, about? When they, uh, they have to establish those relationships with their uh, farmers on their region oh. and to, try to give them uh, the, the information. How, uh, like, what would be the best strategy that you think they could use for when they still establishing those relationships? Well, um, you know, I, I'm kind of an old school guy and I've been to a lot of farmer meetings. And I think, you know, having those kinds of uh, uh, events where there's an educational component and you have kind of a social component, you know. Uh, that works out really well. Here in Alabama, uh, we have the Alabama Cattlemen's Association. They have a lot of county meetings that I attended. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. You go to those meetings and you get to meet people. And, you know, at first they're acquaintances. And then after a while, they become your friends, you know. And uh, the, 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 the more closely you can uh, interact with people like that on a personal basis, I think the more receptive they are to your educational message. And, uh, and, and as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, you know, people, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So every opportunity you get to let people know that you really do care about them. And by the way, people, their, their radar screen is always on. Uh, even even over the phone, people can assess very quickly whether you're really trying to help them or not. And my advice is, if you're serious about uh, education aspects of what you're doing, care about them and, and let them know you care about them, because that will come across very quickly. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but that's, that's what came to mind. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Ball. Um, as always, I always enjoy listening to you talk. Dr. Ball, um, I I got to uh, follow him as a forage specialist and has always loved hearing his advice because it's nice having him to be able to run to when I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so I appreciate that he is still on campus and easily accessible. So um, I think Dr. Ball indicated that he's going to be able to hang out for a little bit um, later if there are more questions. I've seen some questions in the chat. So um, Dr. Ball, are you still able to hang out for a little while after three o'clock? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. So um, we'll try to get to those questions then. Um, for now, we're going to move on to our next topic for the sake of time. So our next speaker is Mr. Jerry Thompson. He is an regional extension agent for Alabama Cooperative Extension housed in the north central location of Alabama. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Jerry both as a student as well as an agent um, at my time at Auburn. He's had a, quite a illustrious career um, here at Auburn, and he's going to speak about some professional development or professional opportunities um, here in the Southeast for Forages. All right. Thank you there, Leanne. This is where I get to say the most famous words in extension, uh, which is, can you see my screen? And yes, sir, we can. Okay. Then I can't be the most relieved guy in America. So, I, and once we get started, I was pretty content that we can roll forward. I just wanted to be able to get started. Um, so let me start out by saying thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, one of the things I wanted to say, and it's going to kind of be a recurring theme throughout my little presentation, I, I was asked to speak about the Southern Pastures and Forage Crop Improvement Conference, which you'll hear me uh, referring to that as either Southern Pastures or SPIFIC or whatnot. And so when Liliani asked me to, to speak about that, my, my first reaction was to say no. It's always my first reaction is to say no. You know, but then I got to thinking about it. And, um, you know, if I asked Liliani to do something, she would she would say yes. So so I wanted to, you know, kind of reciprocate that. And like I said, that'll be a little recurring theme as we go through here talking about my experiences with Southern Pastures. Uh, and then I found out I was going to get to follow Dr. Don Ball. So Liliani has a habit of putting me on the program after people like Dr. Ball and Dr. Joe Bowden, Dr. Ken Quisenberry. Um, pretty hard to shine when that's when that's what you're following, but on the other hand, that's what you got. So, um, and so I would say out of that, uh, Dr. Ball is probably not gonna be long, but I'm gonna need to, to borrow your mistletoe. Uh, so also part of the reason I wanted to go ahead and, and say yes to Liliani today. And, and, and Liliani's question to Dr. Ball about you know, young agents, how, how do you kind of establish yourself and, and, and answer your client questions when maybe you don't know all the answers yet, because I sure don't. But, but one technique that I have found that's really worked for me over the years, and I, I say this with all sincerity, is I can start the sentence with, well, I've asked Dr. Ball, and Dr. Ball said, and then everybody goes, well, all right then, you know, so, um, and, and I've shut down arguments that way. I've been able to kind of, um, you know, give credence to my answers by saying things like that. And so there's been times I've asked Dr. Ball and, and other specialists, like, hey, I just need to, I need to hear you say these words. So then I could say, I asked you about that. So anyway, I was asked to talk about uh, Southern Pastures and Forage Crop Improvement Conference. Uh, so I'm kind of throwing up here on the screen a bit of a map that shows, um, that specific, it's a joint effort of 13 Southern states and, and Puerto Rico, and, and these are the states. Um, Southern Pastures Forest Crop Improvement Conference started about 80 years ago uh, in Montgomery, Alabama, just a group of uh, forage researchers and experiment station managers just got together to talk about the issue of the day. I, I don't know why they didn't use Zoom. That would have been a better use of their time back in the 30s, um, but they chose to get together in person. And so, uh, they did get together and, 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 and had a good experience doing that, just sharing thoughts about things. And so they decided then to get together as a more formal meeting the next year in Tifton, Georgia. And that was the, the birth of the Southern Pastures Forest Crop Improvement Conference. So Southern Pastures, are, so what is it? It's, it's exactly what the name says. It's a conference. And what's it a conference of? Conference about forest crop improvement. You know, the name exactly says that. And so who, who's it open to? Um, well, it's open to, to most everybody, extension agents and specialists and university researchers, plant breeders, grad students. Uh, I can tell you from having been on the inside of, of, of SPIFIC, we're not going to check your ID card at the door. 
if you show an interest in, in coming to the meeting, we'll be glad to have you there. And so my first experience with a Southern Pastures meeting, um, if I remember right, it was in 2007 in Mariana, Florida. Uh, and Dr. Ball, had, had, in response to kind of a question about, you know, where could I get more uh, forage education? And he, he indicated it would be okay for somebody like me to come to a Southern Pastures meeting, so I did. And, as I mentioned, it was in Mariana, Florida, and um, Doug Mayo, who's going to be maybe the person that directly follows me, Doug Mayo from Mariana, Florida, was largely in charge of putting together that meeting. So um, I appreciate his efforts back then, and and, and sure enough, I, I I found it to be a I had my impression of Southern Pastures prior to me going, and it's part of what I want to convey today. I my impression was it was a meeting for specialists and, and really important people. A and it is. And it's also for people like me. So not specialists, not important. So uh, it's a loose knit organization. Uh, it's, it's, it, it would shock you to know how loose this, this organization is, especially when you see the product that gets turned out of it. Um, but currently the chairman of it is Dr. Mike Trammell from Oklahoma State. And, Dr. Leanne Dillard is the is the chair elect. Uh, Dr. Brett Rushing from Mississippi State is is the currently the secretary treasurer, and Dr. Ball will have an appreciation for this. And that and that Brett's taken over uh, that position from Dr. Wink Allison, who was the forage crop agronomist in, at LSU, and and the brains and the 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 the, the preservation of knowledge of, of of southern pastures for the past twenty something years. And so he's either has retired or is planning to retire, but he did step down at the last Southern Pastures meeting um, and we'll miss him. We'll miss him greatly. But Brett will be up to that task. It'll take a little while to get um, to get on it. Maybe I skipped over it in my, my um, first introductory slide, but I had the privilege of being the, the, the chair of last year's Southern Pastures meeting, the 75th annual. Um, well, it's not really an annual, but the 75th. Uh, Southern Pastures meeting, and it was in Asheville, North Carolina, and and I was really lucky to be uh, the chairman of that. Enjoyed it greatly, and so so in addition to the chair and the chair elect and secretary treasurer, there's a couple other key leaders in that, and they just kind of roll on because they're good people that do good things. Um, Dr. Rocky Lemus kind of is in charge of the posters and presentations, and Dr. Vanessa Corrier, she uh, Corrier Olson, she's um, she does the proceedings. And then after that, there's kind of a, there's a loose thing in here, and I don't know exactly what to call it, but let's just call it a planning committee. Um, and so how do you get to be on the planning committee? Well, you basically just show up and don't leave when they ask you to. Um, so, but but how it happened for me, it was, uh, I don't remember the exact year, it was five or six or seven years ago, I lose track, but we were in Arkansas at Southern Pastures, I, I know that for sure. And uh, I was out to dinner with friends, and, and I got a text from Dr. Ann Blunt, a forage breeder in Florida and a, and a really good friend and mentor of mine. And she she said, well, we, we're having a meeting, and we think that you should be part of, at the time, maybe they were looking to have a more formalized planning committee than it is now, maybe. But And she said, we think you should be a part of it. And by text, I replied, it's like, I, I don't think I'm up for that, Dr. Uh, Dr. Blunt. I'm, you know, I'm just me. I, I don't think it's it, I don't think it's for me and she said yeah we think it is and so I said well if you think so you know I'll trust your judgment and, and I'll say yes um, so here again a case of where my initial reaction was to say no and it turned into saying yes and it led to a really good experience um, and so in carrying on with the theme of um, saying no or initially thinking to say no and then saying yes. Um, after being on the planning committee for a few years and, and on the next slide, I'll show you a few things that I was able to accomplish on, the, on that committee. But I was riding a horse up a really steep hill in Big Southport Park, it's on, up on the Tennessee Kentucky line. And it's a pretty steep hill. And my phone rang and my first thought was, wow, I didn't know I get phone service here. And then the second thought was, I don't know anybody in Louisiana. I'm not going to answer this. So we get to the top of the hill and we're going to have to let the horses rest a bit. And so I check my messages here again, remaining amazed that I get service as far out in the world as we were. 
And it was, it was Wink Allison had called and said, hey, call me back when you get a chance. Well, Wink Allison don't call me on a regular basis, so I called him back as soon as I could right then. And, I, and he said, well, he said, we had a meeting of the, of the leadership of Southern Pastures, and, and we thought maybe you'd be a good choice to be chair legs and, and chairman in future years. I said, well, that's great. What did y'all think about after you sobered up? He said, well, we feel, still thought it'd be a reasonably good idea. So here again, my first reaction was, no, it doesn't pay any extra, you know, and, and I just didn't feel like I was up to the running in the circles of people that I know have been providing the leadership for that. But then I got to thinking that um, it is a good organization that I've enjoyed being a part of. Um, and so I did say yes and became chair elect and started down the path of, of, of being chairman that involved a little detour through COVID and that sort of thing. So, uh, but anyway, he, they did ask and I, I, I did say yes. I will say there's an important part. There's no membership dues. This is a very affordable conference. I'm gonna show you some more information as that come up, but there, you don't have to pay dues. There's no membership role and that sort of thing. Maybe there should be, but there's not that I know of. So the Southern Pastures, it rotates among the member states. Um, on somewhat of a regular or irregular basis. And, and by that, that, I say, you know, sometimes it'll be on the east side, sometimes it'll be on the west side of the region, kind of up and down. It moves around and, you know, by, by virtue of what state has not hosted it lately. Um, and so it'll be coming soon to, to a state near you. Don't know when, don't know where you live, but it'll be coming soon to a place near you. Um, the date of the Southern Pastures meeting, um, is um, determined by the host state. And so it tends to happen during the summertime, but some states would rather host uh, because of what they want to look at, or maybe this what's going on in their state, maybe they would like to have a spring thing. Sometimes it's a summer thing, um, and, and maybe late summer. So, um, and it's, um, it's a pretty informal, user-friendly uh, type of organization in that there's no, uh, banquets, there's no award ceremonies, that sort of thing. So it's come as you are. This is a learn something about forages while you're here. Um, the, the tours, um, you know, they're, they're largely determined um, by the states. Um, let's see. Um, and, and, um, and so the the conference usually begins um, on a Tuesday and we finish after lunch on Tuesday and we finish by lunch on Thursday. And so as I was saying, one of the things that um, that maybe I made a, an impact on right away when, when Dr. Blunt had asked me to be part of this committee and so we, we met the next day and, and traditionally up to that point, the meeting had already started on a Monday and finished on a Wednesday. And so I asked them, I said, why is that? Because on that particular year when we were in Arkansas, um, it had us all traveling on Mother's Day. And so maybe that was kind of not the way some people wanted to spend Mother's Day, that Sunday in order to be in Arkansas by, by Monday. And so when asking the question of, you know, why does it start on Monday? Why does it, does it have to? Is there, and, and it was an honest question, is, is there a reason? And everybody kind of looked around and said, I don't know, we just always started on Monday. I said, any reason we couldn't start on Tuesday? Everybody kind of looks around and goes, no. So that was one of my first impacts on Southern Pastures is, is I moved it from starting on a Monday to starting on a Tuesday. And so for those of y'all that, um, that might be wanting to attend, you're welcome. Uh, so everything, we, it, it's, uh, every effort's made to keep the cost of the conference as, as affordable as possible, um, but still maintain it as a nice professional event. You know, and so, um, you know, on the high end of, of what the conference is like, we, one of our, our uh, meeting locations was Hotel Roanoke in Virginia, which is super nice, by the way, and really good. And maybe on the other end of that spectrum, we, we met in a community building under a bridge in, in Apalachicola, Florida. So here, you know, and so a very inexpensive conference. Um, but you know what those two things had in common? They were both really good. 
And so it doesn't matter about, you know, fancy buildings or, or, or community centers, they were all really good. And so I got here at the bottom of this slide, one of the registration calls. So professional attendee, like a specialist, a regional extension agent, one well, 140. Um, for a student or county agent, 75, spouse, 30. So I, I, I would contend that you can eat $75 worth of food. So it, it's, it's and, and we feed you pretty good. And so the tours and that sort of thing, pretty good. So here again, I've already mentioned, we make the uh, Southern pastures as friendly as we can. You don't have to dress up. You don't have to pack, you know, coats and ties and dress, dress boots and whatnot. Just come as you are. We're happy to have you there. Um, so the, the, the tours usually take on a theme. Uh, the host state gets to decide a lot of things. Um, and so this past year, when we were in North Carolina, the theme was, was uh, because we were in Asheville, North Carolina, the theme was about locally produced uh, foods and, and that sort of thing. That, that area of North Carolina is all about that. And so it was a wonderful experience and uh, the, the host state kind of sets the tours up and it was great. Um, formal presentations tend to be really practical. I'm going to roll into our, our, our agenda here in just a minute. Um, and, and so here again, this, the second thing this, that we give significant effort to make Southern Pastures be beneficial to young agents and specialists, grad students, that sort of thing. So here again, when they ask me to be on the planning committee, they, they might would re rescind that if they had the opportunity to, but too late now, the cat's out of the bag. But at the time, you know, I was being leaned on that I needed to be presenting at, um, at national and regional organizations and meetings and that sort of thing. So, so I asked, you know, how could we make this more friendly uh, for those, those people that need those experiences? And I, I'm going to touch back on that here in the, in the next slide or two. Uh, but we do try to make it, it if, if you're young, uh, mid-career, whatnot, don't feel like you've got to be an experienced agent to get some benefit out of Southern Pastures. So this was just the outside cover of last year's flyer, and then we'll get to the agenda for the day, and I'm, I'm not going to belabor this and, and read every part of it, but what I would want to say is that on the first part of the first day, that's usually a kind of an overview of the state, so that'll be, it'll change by the state, so this year you can see the things that they that North Carolina chose to touch on. And it's usually one of the more enjoyable parts of the meeting. Then we'll have a little break. We'll have a couple of what I might call maybe technical presentations. Um, almost always really good stuff that's very practical. But what I want to draw your attention to here down there at the bottom on the left side is the 3.30 p.m. lightning and blitz poster summaries. So as I mentioned, when I first was asked to be a part of this organization and I, I started pushing for how can we make this good for young agents or mid-career agents, that sort of thing. And so this lightning and blitz poster summary. So for one thing, you can present posters at Southern, at Southern Pastures, just like you can at most of the, the good uh, meetings that you might attend in a year. But uh, so you can get the credit for having made a poster presentation. But then we, we select among those that choose to do a, a poster presentation for what we call a lightning or blitz round. And it's basically the opportunity to give a five minute timed, five minutes only, uh, summary of your poster. And then you get to kind of put on your CV that you were a presenter at Southern Pastures that year. Um, and so that's a really great opportunity that I would encourage you to take advantage of. Um, it seems like it would be simple. It's five minutes and five slides. Um, but perhaps it's not quite as, as, as easy as it might seem in that um, and last year, Dr. Katie Mason presented, and as she finished, she looked over at me and said, that's the hardest thing I've ever done. And I said, thank you. That's what I wanted it to be. Uh, but the, the pressure is to get five minutes. It's not that you don't know the topic. It's to get your point across in five minutes. Um, so take advantage of that opportunity. It's a wonderful opportunity to, to present at a major conference. Here on the right, you look on the, the midday of the conference is always a tour day, highlight of the day. Uh, you go see some good things. And here again, it, it takes on the flavor of the host state because North Carolina was looking to, to uh, highlight the local grown, local sold uh, part of their, their agriculture. That's kind of what this tour was about. Uh, but the tours are a wonderful opportunity to get to know people 
that's where I'm going to kind of finish my, my slides here in a bit. Um, but just where else? Dr. I've learned so much from Dr. Ball about making statements like that. Where else are you going to have the opportunity to see Dr. Joe Bowden go down a two-story tall uh, circular slide? I did. It was an outstanding opportunity. So, and then on, we finish up on, on, on Thursday uh, with some more kind of the, what I call like the more sciencey type stuff. Usually takes on the theme of a hot topic in the industry or something like that. And then we'll be done by lunch and you can get home before dark, maybe depending on how far away you live. So, um, this is where I get the gratuitous slides from me being in Australia, kind of the humble brag type thing. Um, I wanted to point out that in 2023, there won't be a Southern Pastures meeting. There won't be a formal Southern Pastures meeting because we're going to encourage everybody to attend the International Grasslands Congress in Covington, Kentucky. And a lot of the people that, that are involved in Southern Pastures are involved in conducting that meeting. So uh, we're not having a formal Southern Pastures, but I, I did want to throw these pictures in here and just tell a little brief story that it was probably 16, 18 years ago. I remember the day, I just don't remember the year. But um, we were hearing a, a presentation from Dr. Ba Dr. Ball at one of our, our team meetings. And my friend Johnny Gladney, after that, he, he looked at me and said, you know, he said, if we're ever going to get to Australia, it's going to be forages that take us, takes us there. It's not going to be livestock. Because Dr. Ball had given a presentation about him and Dr. Lacefield and some of the great places they've been. And so that was been about maybe 04, 05. And in 13, I did get the opportunity to go to the International Grasslands Congress uh, in Sydney, Australia. And so I want to encourage you to do that. That I, I, Liliani asked me to speak about Southern Pastures, but you have the opportunity to not travel very far and attend the International Grasslands Congress. I don't remember the last time it was held in the States, but it's, I, I, it's been a while, and it'll be a while before it comes back again. This is a great opportunity, and you should do it. Um, but we will have a Southern Pastures meeting in 2024. It's going to be hosted by Georgia. The exact location has not been determined. Uh, I've been all over North Georgia, where I think it's going to be in North Georgia. Uh, I think the odds of seeing a kangaroo in North Georgia are fairly small. Uh, I don't think you're going to see the Sydney Opera House there. Uh, matter of fact, if you live in around Blairsville, Georgia, you don't even get the Grand Ole Opry till Tuesday afternoon sometime. But it will be a wonderful opportunity. It'll be a great experience. And 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 so uh, no no Southern Pastures this year. It will be in 24 in Georgia. But International Grassland Congress, put it on your list. Figure out a way to get there. It'll be good. So as I wind up here, um, I'm going to kind of skip over the first sentence about why should you be involved in, in Southern Pastures and go to right to the second thing. There's a lot of good organizations to be a part of. Liliani asked me to talk about Southern Pastures because I had immediate past experience with that. Um, but things like AFGC, uh, the National Ag Agent Association, I think Brian Beard's going to be speaking, you know, after me. Great organizations, great opportunities, things that you should take, a, take advantage of. The point here is active participation is the key to getting something out of these things, not just going, uh, not just sort of listening, you know, the 80% or 20, actually 20% of the presentation that Dr. Ball mentioned with the Pareto principle there, but active participation. Um, and so, so why would you want to become involved in Southern Pastures? Not instead of the other, but in, in addition to, um, why would you want to? I, I'm going to tell you, it's all about the connections and, and not just connections that help you get another job or, you know, they say, oh, you got to know somebody to get that job. It's about the connections that you make. Southern Pastures is, is big enough to be something. It's a real thing. It, it, it's a notable thing. It's, so it's big enough to be a thing, but it's small enough to be an important part of it. Uh, and it's small enough to, to really get in there and rub elbows with people and, and make those connections. Um, because of my involvement in Southern Pastures, and I've been really lucky in lots of other opportunities too, but because of Southern Pastures, I, I could call any forage crop agronomist in the Southeast and have a conversation with them and they'll know who I am. Um, and so, and, and, and out of that, I know who they are and maybe who could help me with this question more than maybe somebody else. Um, 
if you go to Southern Pastures, you, you get to hang out with some really cool people. You know, um, you get to hang out with, with forage crop legends like Carl Hovland, Gary Lacefield, and Don Ball. If you don't know who those people are, you're not paying attention. Read the book. See if I can get in focus there. But anyway, Southern Forages, read the book. They're the authors of the book. And I've got to hang out with those guys uh, in the past with Dr. Hovland and, and, and really learn how they see, how, learn how they care about things. It's amazing how much those guys care. Um, you know, I get to, get to rub elbows, learn, and spend time with personal heroes of mine. Dr. Ann Blunt, I mentioned her earlier. She was the first person that told me, you know, you could be a part of Southern Pastures, and, and, and you could be an important part of that. And uh, that's her in the lower right-hand side of the screen. I, I, I don't know if anybody has a picture of Dr. Blunt. Um, that she's not got her hands in grass, you know, on her knees looking in grass. A every picture I have, Dr. Dr. Blunt is, is looking at grass. So when I first started going to Southern Pastures, it was, um, it, it kind of covered the years after Dr. Ball had retired. And she just, uh, it was Johnny Gladney and myself and maybe a couple other people, but mostly Johnny and me. And she's like, come on guys, y'all hang out with the Florida crew. I'll show you how this game is played, you know? And, and I've learned so much from Dr. Blunt. Um, and, and then, you know, get to hang out with guys like Dennis Hancock, and Gary Bates, um, Wink Allison, for sure, and, and Matt Poore, a personal hero of mine about the way uh, I, I, I would love to think that someday I could instruct like Matt Poore. I won't be able to, but I would like to believe I might could. Um, and then you get to, and, and so I'm getting older. I mean, I, you know, some of my personal heroes are, are are retiring and that sort of thing, but I also get to hang out with some of the up and coming people. Um, and maybe I can be a little bit of help to them. I know they can help me. Uh, but people like Dr. Deidre Harmon, she was kind of walking point on, on the uh, Southern Pastures meeting in, in North Carolina last year. Um, you know, one of the things about Dr. Harmon is if, you know, if you have a need and I say, well, Deidre, I need so-and-so. And she said, I'll handle that. And I go, fine, I'm done. But Deidre said she'll handle it. It's done, you know. But you get to hang out with, you know, the, the up and comers of the world, and they're they're here with us today. Leanne Biller, uh, Marcelo Olo, uh, and Lilian, uh, for sure. I mean, you get to hang out with those kinds of people and, and have wonderful experiences. And you get to hang out with some of the the people that are going to be important, like Maggie Justice. I was some of the, you know, that we all should have a Maggie Justice in our life to make our lives be better. So. With that, I'm going to kind of finish up. I think I've used about my time. Uh, but just to encourage you to, to become involved in something and not just go to something, become involved in something. Your initial reaction is going to be to say no. It doesn't pay anything extra. Uh, but but give, it, give it a try. Say yes to something. Say yes to being involved. Say yes to not just going and listening to the presentations, but, but get in there and let, and let Dr. Blunt show you something down there on the ground. Uh, let Jennifer Tucker show you something, you know, that's, she's in the left-hand picture there. There's people to learn from. They want to share with you. Uh, and that's how you get to where you can help your clients is being able to interact with these more experienced people that will show you things that you can learn, and then you can teach them to others. Uh, so with that, I'll wind up that part of the presentation and um, welcome any questions, thoughts, comments, or as... Um, Kent Stanford would say emotional outburst. So, but I appreciate the opportunity and I'm so relieved to be done with it. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I want to turn it over to Liliani to, to answer, to have any questions or have us move on. Does anybody have any questions? You're welcome to unmute yourself if you do. So, uh, Jerry, I was actually like your last slide was the question that I just wanted to uh, ask you to emphasize, but I think you emphasize that um, enough uh, with really being active, especially thinking about the younger, the earlier uh, professionals that we have here in the group. So at this time, I think we we should uh, we can just move forward. And uh, Dr. Valau, can you introduce our next speaker? Definitely. So it'd be a pleasure and um, um, really enjoy Gary, uh, Gary's uh, conversation here and the importance of, uh, of that history, especially for us that are 
on the early early part of the career and participating on those groups. Uh, so I appreciate all that. So talking about history, my um, our next speaker here has a lot of history to show. Doug Mayo is an extension agent and county extension director in Jackson County, Florida, has been with extension for 27 years. Doug has actually led many beef and forage programs, both local, regional, state, and multi-state. He was part of um, the beginning of our Southeastern Hay Contest, and that's what he's going to talk about today, which also had the influence of uh, some of the specialists at that time, like Dr. Blunt and Dr. Hancock. So I uh, invite Doug here to, to join us and, and enlighten us about the history and also hopefully the, important, the importance of the Southeastern Hay Contest. Doug, I'm not sure if you were saying anything, but we can not hear you yet. Still, still can hear you. Can you hear me now? Ah, uh, here we go. Okay, I got this fancy microphone, so I'd sound good, and then didn't know how to work it. Apologize for that. Um, can you uh, can you see my screen there with the picture with a e girl in the hay bales? Yes, sir. There is a, there is a younger younger gentleman that does not resemble the one speaking. Well, that wasn't that long ago. All right. Well, I'm going to talk to you about the Southeast Hay Contest. And um, I had the honor of uh, taking one of those trips with Jerry and others from uh, Georgia and Alabama. And we went up to Virginia and we uh, saw that the, there was such a thing as a hay contest. And on the way home in the van, all the agents and specialists were talking and we thought it'd be a great idea. Uh, there was a relatively new concept called a relative forage quality that was different from RFV or relative forage value that was being used to evaluate Southern forages to have a better indicator of quality for high fiber tropical grasses. So all this discussion on the way home was, all right, how do we get people to, how do we get people to uh, buy into this? And uh, we liked the idea of a hay contest. And so uh, basically we started thinking and talking and, meeting uh, over the phone in different ways. And we put together the rules and they've changed some over the years, but pretty much the, the main concept of the Southern uh, Southeast Hate Contest was born. Uh, it does include um, all the Southern states. Matter of fact, it even goes into Texas and Oklahoma. I'm not sure how they got in, but somehow. And um, it the idea is we, we want to promote hay and forage quality. I mean, that's basically the the key concept, and uh, it is uh, it is a challenging thing to get people to test hay. Uh, as Marcelo mentioned, I've been working in extension a long time, and I'm still not getting but a small percentage of the producers in in the county to test hay. But it is growing; it is slowly catching on, and uh, um, it is important, um, but also it's a great way for agents to build relationships with producers. And uh, I, I enjoyed hearing Don Ball share his words of wisdom. Uh, one of my pearls of wisdom for you is that uh, extension is about building relationships. It's not um, 
you become you becoming a resource person and and that only comes over time and it comes with trust and so one of the things that you've got to figure out with every producer in your county or wherever you're charged to serve is figure out ways to connect with them one of the ways that i have found that works well is the southeast hay contest um I have some fairly expensive equipment and I made the decision years ago that I wasn't going to loan out the equipment that I was going to go to the farm and take the samples. And, uh, you know, it, it has not gotten overwhelming to the point that I felt like I just needed to provide a checkout of equipment. I've gone myself and it is a great way, even with the people I know well to check in every year. Yeah. We talk about their, forage we talk about their operation but we we cover a lot of ground since the last time we've been together and uh, uh so it is a great tool to help you build relationships especially with the ones that are the hardest the people with the most experience the people who are doing the best job in your county it's a way to touch base with them and every time we take a hay sample there's a teachable moment in there somewhere trying to work with them to help them figure out what influenced the quality of that particular cutting. Now you can see in this picture, a young man uh, from 23 years ago, and I was doing a uh, cattleman's tour in my county and I was demonstrating uh, forage sampling. Many people had never seen it. And uh, so I was, that was part of my demonstration. This was during a drought year and we were bailing our corn because we weren't going to make any grain. But I wanted to show them how simple it was to uh, take a sample. So, uh, you know, I was a little bit younger then. But, um, you know, every producer in your county has some interaction with hay of some level. They buy it, they sell it, they raise it, they feed it, something. And so it is a, a very common practice with livestock operations in our, in our viewing area here. And... Uh, so it is a, a great opportunity, and I love this quote. I, I stole it uh, from Jennifer Tucker in Georgia. Don't guess forage test. And it, it is really uh, proven to me over and over again um, that uh, how hay looks is a pretty poor guide for how good it is. And uh, um, kind of a term that I have coined from using forage test to help with conversations on farms is it gives you the opportunity to do variable rate feeding. You know, everybody likes to talk about variable rate farming and how wonderful that is. Well, it's the same thing. If you can test your base forage, then we can figure out for each cutting or each quality type they have on their farm, just exactly how much supplement we need for the groups they're feeding. So to me, that's variable rate feeding. Now, what do you got to have? Um, it is not inexpensive to uh, be able to test round bales of hay or silage. Um, I recommend having at least a 20 volt half inch drill. Um, the one in, your, in the picture there was my first model um, and it has two amp batteries and you better have at least two of them if you're going to do more than a couple of cuttings at one time. Uh, I have now graduated to the eight amp battery that's a lot more expensive, but I can test pretty much whatever they have on, on one battery, one charge. And uh, there's nothing more aggravating than collecting samples and then having your battery get weaker and weaker and not being able to finish. Um, there are lots of different types of hay probes and I don't know that I have found the best one. I was recommended a the best harvest hay probe by somebody. And uh, that's what I have now. What you see on the screen is an older one I had from NASCO. Um, and it works fine. Um, the only negative with the one from NASCO is that you have to take the probe apart every time that you want to empty the um tube into the sample bag and so the hay the best harvest connects to a one gallon ziploc bag and you you still have to plunge it but it's connected to the bag only problem is if you don't hold on to it it'll do circles around it while you're testing so uh 
that I'm, I may look at a different one next time I need to. Um, but there are a variety of options, but you can see here, um, you're looking at several hundred dollars to get started. And uh, you may have to be creative on uh, how you can get a budget for 500 or more dollars to get a sampling set. Um, you may have to get some help from your cattlemen association or perhaps um, set some fees for programming that normally are free or however your um, budget allows. It is definitely something that's a, a good investment. Um, just so you know, uh, for the Southeast Hay Contest, um, we are expected to collect um, loose hay in a two-gallon Ziploc bag. That's basically if your uh, producer happens to win in one of the top three in the category, uh, they they have a sample that they can show at the Sunbelt Ag Expo. Uh, the main thing is that it has to go to the lab. You have to have at least a quart of um, ground forage from the probe, which is typically somewhere between five and 10 uh, core samples of a round bale or a square bale. It works on either one. Um, the probe that I purchased is made to attach to one gallon bag, but you don't have to fill up a whole gallon. That would take a lot of bale samples to do. Um, but uh, you do want to collect um, both because if you don't and you do happen to have a category winner, you're going to have to go back. And I've had to do that before. One thing that's important, you, you there is a, a entry form that has to be submitted with each and every sample. You can't do one sample for five, uh, one uh, one form for five samples. Every single sample has to have a um, a form to go with it, so they know all about it. And uh, um, so I encourage you to fill out the bottom section that's for the agent and make copies. That's what I do. Um, and I would also encourage you, if you send in samples to the South Ace Hay Contest, to have a record sheet. One of the things that's a little frustrating when you send in a sample, um, you get it back with your number that you assign. So it would be, in my case, FL for Florida, Jackson for my county, and number one through whatever. Uh, it doesn't tell you which cutting it was or what, you know, you know the category it was in, but the form when you get it back, it's helpful to know um, more information and, and, uh, and, and have your own record sheet so that you can talk with the producer um, once you get the results from the lab email to you. So uh, one of the things that's uh, obvious about it, but it's still important, is you know it may be that like me here in this photo, you see uh, uh, Bill Conrad and his uh, wife uh, who came to the Sunbelt Egg Expo to be recognized for their perennial peanut hay. Um, so certainly you uh, have the opportunity to have some of your best producers recognized across the South for the quality of their hay. Um, all the samples are ranked on the RFQ score. And uh, first, that's kind of a teachable moment too. What is RFQ? And my best answer for you is, it is an EPD for hay. So it is a one number index that indicates forage quality. And it takes, there's a whole equation that takes fiber and digestibility and protein and basically it gives you one number, which you need for a contest um, to be able to rank um, or rate hay samples amongst all the entries. It does add a little to the cost of hay sampling, but it's about $2 more to be in the hay contest than just to send in a sample. So it's not a big expense. Um, it gives quality data for hay and baleage. And that's probably the biggest thing is is it gives you those teachable moments where you can, even with your elite producers, talk about um, what they grew and how good it is and how they might want to utilize it. And uh, um, and many of our better hay producers are also marketing some of their hay to help offset their costs. So it is also a marketing tool. Unfortunately, uh, the customers go into hay um Providers don't ask for this, and uh, but part of it is they don't know, they may not know it's available. So it, it's uh, 
we're also trying to teach the consumer about uh you know trying to find quality hay and uh i have had a few phone calls not near enough that said i want to buy hay from somebody who tests it and uh I, that's a great tool to have is i've been to this farm i've tested their hay and you know and and they can they can provide this for you so just a little overview of the contest itself um the website is listed there uh just google southeast hay contest you'll find the blog site um they sponsor each they find sponsors each year this picture is a little dated we've lost some of those sponsors and added some different ones but uh each each category sponsored so there is some prize money to go along um as i mentioned it's 22 dollars a sample it has to be submitted by the farm that produced the forage so if you get one of those calls about somebody who just wants to test hay they purchased it is not eligible for the southeast a contest just send it into the lab and and you can still have that teachable moment uh but it according to the rules it has to be submitted by the farm that grew it one other thing that we that i insisted on is that each entry form be signed by the county agent that's the only way we can really verify that people are submitting something they grew that agent is involved the entry deadline is september 1st if you uh think about the hay season that excludes kind of our fall cuttings of hay and that used to be an issue but we've changed the rules and uh just keep submitting those samples if, if it's after september 1 it'll be in next year's contest um so you can basically now submit hay year round with these uh same guidelines and it just depends on when it's coming in is when how when it will be judged um so uh, you know october november hay samples will be um in the pre in the following year's contest so why do we want to do this well you get the number one reason is you're you're getting some real benefits from having forage sampled uh, the grower gets a quality report that tells them the protein, the TDN, and the RFQ. Um, the agent gets an opportunity for interaction. Almost everybody that I've dealt with the first time doesn't understand as sample versus dry matter. So that's a, at least one conversation that you have. Um, we're boosting a, a good partnership program when we're all supporting the same hay contest. Uh, the consumers uh, who are buying hay from these growers have more information. And the bottom line is the livestock get the right amount of supplement if they take the time to uh, use these results for uh, variable rate feeding. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Um, uh, your state may have something similar, but there is a uh, University of Florida created a UF hay balancer. It's a very simple program it certainly not managed to um, figure out detailed uh, balanced rations but if a grower is just trying to take the hay they grew and figure out maybe one or two supplements that might be used uh, over the winter it can help you figure that out so um, the lab results you know gives you those basic guidelines and then you can plug them into a spreadsheet and we can talk about ways to get the quality improved uh, i'll never forget a husband and wife they came in they were telling us how their customers love their hay and they were so proud of the hay they grew and they wanted to, to be a part of this uh southeast hay contest and when they got their results back they were horrified and they were like our hay was only eight percent protein and we thought we had excellent hay and so it looked nice they did a good job drying it they made a lot of tonnage, but it really wasn't as good a quality as they thought. So there was some real opportunity to talk about managing um, the how off, how frequently. I mean, that was their biggest issue. He was cutting hay two to three times a year when he needed to be cutting it four to five times a year. Um, but uh, so it was a good opportunity. And, you know, it gives you that opportunity too to talk about winter supplementation options and uh 
the last thing is, is there some success stories that you can share in your reporting? Like Dr. Ball mentioned, we all dislike reporting, but it is important for people to know that what we're doing is valuable and that, um, you know, what we're doing makes a difference. So what's in it for you? Um, like I mentioned to start with, the number one thing that this has helped me with is building relationships with hay producers in your county. Um, you know, it, uh, and it takes time. And my best uh, advocates are people I've worked with the previous year, and they talk to other people about, have you had your hay tested? And you don't have to submit to the hay contest. Um, for instance, the University of Georgia has a $15 or $20 sample, depending on if you want to test for nitrates. Um, the states you serve may have a, another option. Um, but I like participating uh, in the Southeast Hay Contest, and I, I have been uh, trying to encourage people, uh, if, if they don't know any better, I just send it in. Um, we, they want it tested. I'll test it and send it into the contest if they're the ones that produced it. Um, I have also used these results for a county contest. So the same fellow that I showed you that got recognized at the Sun Belt uh, Ag Expo, Bill Conrad, with his family there, he was also recognized with our Farm City Banquet as the Hay Farmer of the Year. So I have even used the results locally. Uh, so maybe your farmer isn't good enough to win the overall categories or, or win the big prize. Um, they, you still have the opportunity for a a local contest um, gives you something you can share with local media. Um, you're, it's an opportunity on an annual basis or multiple times a year to stop in and take a sample. It really doesn't take that long to sample a cutting or two, and you get an opportunity to catch up and uh, kind of have a purpose for those visits. And then when you get the results back, you get that teachable moment, even if they've been doing it for years, to talk about how it came out. And I know a lot of folks are, are working these days to try to show some impact for their promotion packets or however, or at least your annual reporting. And I figured out a way to do this with the Sunbelt, with the uh, Southeast Hay Contest. So as uh, was mentioned, I, I helped start this program uh, in 2004. We just had 40 entries and our our top level in uh, 2021, it grew to 387 entries. So the, the contest has really taken off. Um, certainly the producers benefit because they have they know more about what they're growing and how good it is. Um, it gives them some real opportunities to uh, promote their products, but also to, to change their management. Um, it helps promote uh, RFQ scores, and uh, it's a great way to um, communicate on a single number instead of just looking at protein, but uh, all the numbers that matter. And certainly there's variability, you know, every cutting, every, the weather is different, the um, variables on fertilizer this past year and others, uh, there's opportunities to kind of watch that. But if you look at the numbers, I started in uh, 2008 tracking this overall contest and then the, the part that producers from Jackson County played. And in 15 years, the RFQ score has improved 25%. So that's pretty significant, but you know, that's, that's just still numbers that don't mean a whole lot. Uh, I also want to point out that you can see from the numbers in yellow, I'm certainly not sending hundreds of samples um, to the contest. Uh, I think I had my best year this year. I had 18 that came from this county, partly because some people don't want it to go into the hay contest. They just want the samples or they didn't grow it. But um, so I'm doing more than those numbers indicate. But uh, the main thing is you can see that I have participated at some level with the growers in Jackson County um, ever since it started. And uh, um, so I can share that information, but what really matters is this RFQ score change or the 25% increase in quality. 
So I, I got a little help. Uh, Dennis Hancock uh, gave me some information that I could use to really put a so what to this. Uh, they actually did a study looking at stem maggot damage. And what their research showed was that uh, stem maggot damage created a 7% drop in RFQ score. And that indicated an additional one and a half pounds of supplement uh, per cow per day, or an additional uh, 13 cents in feed per head per day. So you can use those numbers, and based on their data, a 25% improvement in hay quality over a 15-year period uh, re could reduce feed costs by 46 cents per head per day, or $55 per cow on a 120-day feeding period. Now, in my county, the average herd size is about 71 head. I have some survey data to show that. So increasing hay quality by 25% would provide a, a $3,900 a year savings in supplemental feed costs. But there's 24,000 cows in my county. So that's a $1.3 million reduction in supplemental feed if our producers we're feeding the best quality hay that we produced uh, this year. Now, that's certainly not possible to say every single animal is going to do that, but there is that opportunity to uh, really reduce costs, and that's something that everybody cares about in our modern times is keeping their costs low. So if they have to feed less because their hay has more nutrients in it, uh, there is significant savings there. So with that, I'll stop and uh, see if we have any any questions. Uh, again, my name is Doug Mayo. I'm in Jackson County or Mariana, Florida. Um, my phone number's there and my email address. Um, the the main thing I wanted you to to hear today is is that uh, there is a real opportunity to do something that's fairly simple that will take years to develop. Um, but it is an opportunity to build relationships, even with those uh, salty veterans that have been raising hay for generations. Uh, they may not know their quality of every single cutting because the answer is nobody can know that without a lab test. Um, and I have certainly learned from all the samples I pulled, you cannot tell by looking. Um, you got to really sample to know and uh, there is some real power of information for helping them uh, improve the efficiency of their operation. If you start with a base forage and know what you're missing for each group so that you can supplement them uh, effectively. Awesome. Doug, thanks for the presentation. Because of time, we're going to jump to the next presentation. I invite, uh, we do have some questions there that already responded on chat. I invite any questions for Doug to be placed on the chat here and we'll be, we'll be answering it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Doug. We really appreciate your talk. So uh, just, uh, we are going to move now to our last speaker. So uh, I would like to welcome Mr. Uh, Brian Beer. He was an extension agent with uh, North Carolina State Extension for 10 years before he joined Clemson. And he has been an agent with us here in Clemson for 16 years now. Mr. Beer covers the North uh, Piedmont region, South Carolina, and he will be talking about the National Association of County Agricultural Agents uh, today. He has really, uh, he has been really active uh, with the um, NEACAA, and he's currently a soft, uh, the Southern uh, Region Director. So, Mr. Beer, thank you so much for uh, talking about this today, and uh, I will turn it to you now. Over to you now. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Silva. Uh, I'll ask the same questions. Can everybody see the slides there? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the National Association of County Agricultural Agents, and a lot of the previous speakers have talked about some uh, things that could help with your professional development, uh, and NACAA is uh, right up there with everything that we have uh, discussed so far. So uh, start off with, um, you know, what is NACAA? And uh, it 
I always preface that whenever I'm around other agricultural agents is that it's it's your professional development organization and um, NACAA is a membership organization that's uh, grassroots. Uh, you you join the National Association of County Agricultural Agents by joining your state uh, association. Um, and by joining your state association, you gain membership into the National Association. Uh, you can't do an end around your state association and join the national. So you got to work through your state associations to be a member. Uh, and And we do strive uh, i'm the southern region director which means i sit on the national board that runs the organization and um and i i'm trying not to be too braggadocious about it but uh, but i really do believe that everyone on that board has the goal of nacaa being the premier professional development association for extension agents and edu extension educators that that have agricultural responsibilities and program work to do um, and everything we do goes around that um, we do try to provide some professional development opportunities uh, throughout the year uh, help to advance your professional status and we've already heard about the relationships and the networking um, it, it's a great place to exchange ideas and a great place to make those connections from uh, folks that are doing the same kind of work you are from other parts of the country. Let you compare notes, um, see how they're doing things different. And oftentimes we kind of laugh. We end up having the same problems, just a different zip code when we start talking to each other. Um, I'll focus a little bit now on those professional development opportunities. Uh, one of the largest things that NACAA does for that is our annual meeting and professional improvement conference. Uh, we refer to it as the AMPIC. Uh, at this event, we have lots of uh, opportunities for uh, to give professional presentations to other members so that you can share your good programming work and your successes. Uh, we have poster sessions that are, are available. Um, both of those things, uh, as you've heard before about helping with your promotion packets and your yearly evaluations. And I know some extension systems put a high value on presenting at national and regional meetings. The NACAA is an opportunity to do that. Uh, and those those presentations are are basically they're competitively selected. Uh, we have so many presentation slots, and and sometimes we have to make some difficult decisions and determine which presentations that we'll hear at at the meeting. So it is competitive. So that that kind of puts a feather in that cap about being selected in a venue like that to give your presentation to your peers. Uh, Pre-conference tours, uh, we have those available in several disciplines, uh, animal science, nat uh, natural resources, and horticulture all have pre-conference tours that happen uh, usually before the, the AMPIC each year. And that's another opportunity to be around folks that are in a like discipline and, and share ideas and along with getting to see um, how they do business in, in other states. Uh, this, this annual meeting does rotate from place to place throughout the, uh, throughout the United States. It, it rotates through the regions. So we're, we're gonna be in different places all the time. So you'll get to see new and more interesting stuff. Uh, the awards, uh, we have several award categories. Uh, communication awards is probably one of our biggest draws as far as uh, folks applying for those. And that's a competitive process where you, you look at different uh, uh, different communications, uh, newsletters, uh, and, and uh, PowerPoint presentations and those type things, websites, all those things get submitted. And uh, the, the winners of those things are very deserving because they're competing against folks from all over the country. And it's 
it's a good uh, good feather to have in your cap if you can become a national finalist or a regional winner in some of those awards categories. And if you become a national winner, there's some money attached to it as well that goes to you. So that's always a plus. And but those are all ways that, that we try to at that annual meeting try to give a good uh, a good boost to the folks that are doing good work and give them a chance to highlight that. Uh, something that we've implemented over the last couple of years is the uh, NACA 365. That's a it's a periodic Zoom presentation on various topics during the year. These are usually happen uh, monthly or every other month. Uh, sometimes is they, they get to be monthly during during some times of the year. Other times of the year we may skip a month in between the two. But those are an opportunity for for you to present to your peers and and uh, be be again help you with that promotion packet and an evaluation tool in your home state uh, because you'll be presenting nationally at those things and it also gives us an opportunity to get some professional development outside of that national meeting which only happens you know, once a year um NACA has a journal, the Journal of NACAA. Um, that's a, it's a it's a peer reviewed journal that uh, allows you a place to publish some of your work if you have that available. Um, and there's also uh, opportunities to be a an article reviewer and and determine what gets placed in the NACAA. So that's a couple of opportunities there as well that can help you professionally if you. Uh, you're in a position where publishing is, is important. Uh, NACAA has a venue for that as well. And NACAA has some scholarships that are available to members for professional improvement activities. Uh, these activities are pretty broad. Folks have used these scholarships uh, to help them uh, pursue an advanced degree. Folks have used those monies to help attend attend conferences and um, I know some people that are on this call that have used those funds to um, help them with an educational trip to uh, other places in the country or other places in the world to help them learn more about how to do their job better. Um, that, that scholarship is available to the members. Uh, there, It's a maximum of $1,500 each application, and you have the opportunity to max out at, uh, to do two of those and, and max out at $3,000 over your lifetime. Um, there is a certain level of giving that we like for the applicants to have reached in order to be eligible for those scholarships. And, uh, but uh, there's more information on that uh, at the NACA website, which I'll put that up at the ends for, for you to review. But those are just some of those professional development opportunities that, that NACAA tries to foster for our members. Uh, this year's AMPIC is uh, gonna be held August 12th through 17th in, in Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, Iowa is, is got a good meeting plan for us in August and we're looking forward to being there. And uh, some future dates coming up, uh, be in Dallas, Texas in, in 2024, uh, Billings, Montana in 2025, and Denver, Colorado in 2026. And so we, we do plan these meetings four years in advance. So we usually have those four years planned four years out as to what locations are we, we're going to be in. And as you can see, the kind of rotation we've got, we bounce around the country and through the regions and give a good opportunity to have a meeting in some places. Uh, so it's not going to the same place every time and seeing the same stuff so it makes it a little more interesting. Uh, again, uh, lots of things at that annual meeting and professional improvement conference to do. Uh, and this is just kind of getting in a little more details. Um, to, to want to highlight the Distinguished Service Award and the Achievement Awards. Those are the two highest awards that we give to our members. And those are peer selected. So this it's career achievement awards. Um, achievement awards are for agents with less than 10 years of, work, of extension work. And the Distinguished Service Award are for those with 10 or more years of, uh, of service with extensions. And, and you know, they, 
we like to make a little bit of a fuss over the folks that win these awards because, like I say, they are our highest um, our highest awards that that, that we give. Um, there's also a search for excellence awards in, in various disciplines. Um, livestock uh, in, in, in is one, and uh, search for excellence 4-H. There's nine categories there that you can apply for. Uh, the communication awards that I mentioned, there's 13 categories there. Uh, and and we do have a SARE, um, SARE and SARE Fellows portion of our meeting that that uh, that works out at our AMPIC, and and we work with SARE to to have some of those activities for some of those sustainable agricultural groups. Uh, Dr. Silva wanted me to touch on you know why did I get involved and, and you know what can NACA do for you and and I think you heard some folks talk about that you know it's you got to be involved and like most things you'll get out of it what you put into it um, but I started out at the uh, on on the on the state level working my way up through the officer ranks of of vice president president elect president past president and at the state level um and then i moved on uh naca has a lot of committees that actually do the bulk of the work of the association uh and i i started out as a a regional vice chair of the animal science committee and did a couple of two-year terms as southern region vice chair of animal science and then i was fortunate enough to be selected to do two terms as the, the National Animal Science Committee chair. And um, and that was a excellent opportunity. And and again, a lot of the work you see that comes comes off at an AEMPIC is really committee work that's that's really hitting the ground. Um, you know, it is this it is a chance of personal recognition, as you know, you can see in that center picture. That's one of the one of the times that I are well, times I was able, fortunate enough to receive a, a be a regional, uh, regional finalist and in in the communication award category, um, and you know that's that was that was a highlight. And that picture of me with my family is in 2017 when I received my DSA award and and at the national meeting in Utah, and. And I know we got a lot of folks on here that are early career, less than five years. Um, I would encourage you to get in, get involved with NACAA and your state association early. Um, I've, I've been in extension just about as long as Doug Mayo. Uh, and, and I waited about four years before I attended my first AMPIC. And I wish I would have started sooner. And uh, and it's it's a it's a great opportunity to to grow professionally, and and the sky's the limit. Um, you know, I had no idea that first annual meeting that I attended, that uh, you know all those regional directors and, and national officers and board members looked like big wigs to me, and they were very very important people, and and I didn't have a clue that I would be sitting in those seats some twenty five or six years later. Um, so don't sell yourself short. I'll tell you that right now. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of like you've heard the theme here before to, at, during some of these other presentations today. Um, you know, people are liable to ask you to do a job and, and, you know, don't, don't just automatically dismiss that. Um, as the, somebody sees some potential in you and somebody sees that you would be a good fit at a certain job, that might be the first step in, in being on a path to being a national officer or on the national board of the CAA. So don't dismiss that um, and, and seriously consider it because it is a great opportunity. And it's, I've made lots of connections all over the country and the networking that happens at NACAA annual meetings is is uh, is tremendous, and and you just you just get to make a lot of connections and hear a lot of a lot of things from all across the country, and it's a, a great experience. Uh, I just refer you to the NACAA's website to to really get the detailed information. Um, 
uh, of anything that I may have discussed today. Um, contact uh, somebody in your state that's involved with their state association and the national association. That, that'd be my first suggestion. If you have questions is talk to those folks that have been involved on your state level. Um, if, if that doesn't give you satisfaction, then contact your regional director or vice directors uh, from your region if you have any questions. And those are listed on, on the website there and you can find them and, and reach out and, and, and ask them the question. Uh, we'll be more than happy to help steer you in the right direction. That's kind of our job as regional directors and vice directors is to be the voice of the membership on the national board. So we want to hear from you. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's about all I have from that. Um, and, and, and again, uh, got my information up there and, and if you're from some other areas of the country, uh, other than the Southern region, then, you know, go to the website, find out who your regional person is, or again, like I said before, find that person in your state that has really been, been involved with NACAA and your state association and, and, and learn how to get involved, uh, that way, because it's, um, as I'm, I'm, I'm not tongue in cheek when I say that I think NACA is is the premier professional development organization for agricultural extension agents and educators because I really believe that, and and everything we try, I try to do, and and the board tries to do is to just maintain that and be sure that we're meeting the needs of our members, um, and hopefully meeting their professional development needs. But with that, that's all that I have. I'll be glad to field any questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, is there any questions? If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask. Um, right now, uh, I'll just go ahead and visit one question that we had before, uh, just after Dr. Ball's presentation, while we wait until other people might have some questions for you, Brian or um, Jerry. So Dr. Ball, uh, Joe Walter from Florida, he asked, the soils in some of our coastal counties have very high uh, pH and he mentioned over eight. Any advice on management for a young or an old uh, agent for forage crops under this situation? I'm, I'm sorry I didn't understand that question. Can you repeat it please? I can. Let me I'll also, if you have access to your uh, chat there, I'll also copy the question uh, on the chat. But uh, the question came from Joe Walter in Florida. So he has the soils in some of our coastal counties have very high pH, over eight. Any advice on management for a young or an old agent for forage crops under this situation? Uh. Well, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I probably can't uh, tell Joe anything he doesn't know because he's had a lot of experience. I know. <laughs> he, he was, he's probably know. better giving this talk than I was. But anyway, uh, you know, uh, we don't have a lot of alkaline soils in Alabama. We do have some in the very west central part of the state. And uh, that does limit uh, what you can grow. And, and of course, it depends on how exactly how alkaline it is i mean you can grow a lot of things if it's only slightly alkaline but when it gets up above eight then it gets very very limited and uh i mean there are i mean for example there are a few things that can tolerate that uh you know uh, actually well uh white clover is quite tolerant of alkalinity in my experience um you know uh I'm not well qualified to answer that because I don't work with those really, really high pH soils very much. Um, I think one thing that you can always do in just about any situation, whether it's alkaline soil or whatever, where you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, even soil moisture differences and so forth, is uh, you know, pay pay real close attention to what's volunteering because you know nature uh, has a way of uh, uh, find. Nature hates a void, 
And uh, if, if things are volunteering that have forage value, then you're probably headed in the right direction by considering those sorts of things. Okay. Well, thank you so much. At this time, we don't have any other questions here. So uh, if anyone has additional questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we are a little past, uh, a little past time uh, now, so I'll just go ahead and uh, thank you everyone again, uh, all the speakers, uh, my, our model, moderators here for the chat and the session today, and also everyone else who participated uh, on this training. We had a very pro uh, productive uh, session. Uh, we got really uh, excellent uh, experience uh, shared and uh, device, devices, uh, devices and uh, everything else for those uh, who are attending here uh, as agricultural professionals. So uh, thank you so much. And I would like to remind everyone, we have another session on Thursday at the same time from 2 to 4 uh, p.m. Eastern time. We will have uh, Dr. David Russell uh, talking about uh, weed control and uh, Mr.